like to continue the reading a couple of verses uh, in Matthew 12, verse uh, 38 through verse 42. And verse 42 will frame our thoughts this afternoon, beginning then in Matthew 12 and verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The title of my message is Gospel Lessons from the Queen of the South. I'd like to consider with you this afternoon a few parallel thoughts that the Queen of Sheba exhibits and plays out as she goes to understand the wisdom and other things from Solomon and our Lord's connecting thought here as he says the Queen of the South will rise up and condemn that generation because of what she did to get truth. Now as you heard our brother read Matthew chapter 12 and we have this ongoing friction between the Pharisees who do not understand or know God's law or recognize Jesus Christ as the Messiah. The Sabbath becomes this great issue of debate. Is it lawful to pluck corn? Is it lawful to eat corn? Or is it not lawful? The man with the withered hand stretches forth his hand and Jesus exhibits mercy and kindness and heals him. The Pharisees cannot understand Christ, so they take counsel how they might destroy him. Jesus Christ continues to go on doing good, explaining God's law. Some are saved unto eternal life. And all the while, the scribes and the Pharisees are in great torment, anguish, ferment. They have an unrighteous indignation against the Savior. And so they say in verse 38, we would see a sign from thee. And even though our Lord had just taught like no other man has ever taught, and even though he has already done a multitude of miracles, they want a sign. And our Lord says, no sign will be given to this generation except the sign of the prophet Jonah as we read. The backdrop being it's an evil and an adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. A wicked generation, an unbelieving generation, a generation that does not take God at his word, a generation of vipers. And in the midst of this ongoing debate, our Lord says this in verse 42, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Think about what that must have meant to the Jews who were trying to catch Christ in an action or in a word. Jesus was saying a woman, a non-Jew, a stranger from the covenant, covenant of promise, who lived at the uttermost parts of the earth, 
would condemn that generation of Jews that was so hard-hearted, unsubmissive to Christ, unfeeling, unseeking, demanding a sign, unknowing of God's word, always a straining after a gnat and swallowing a camel. And Christ points to her, and he uses her to teach them, to remind them there was some other spirit within her. There was something that motivated her. And in that account, I believe we see some gospel parallels, some tremendous truth that remind us what it means to come to Christ, how we should put ourselves out, even though it's all of grace. So I'd like to consider with you, I believe your outline's, outline says five, I'd like to consider with you four gospel lessons from the Queen of the South. And so if you would turn to that account in 1 Kings, I would like to read that account from 1 Kings chapter 10 and the first 13 verses. And this is the account that our Lord points to, reminding them of what transpired in 1 Kings chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. We read this. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train with camels that bear spices, and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom, and the house that he had built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in my own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believed not the words until I came, and my eyes have seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and thy prosperity exceed the fame which I heard. Happy are thy men. Happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee and that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God which delighteth in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, therefore made he king to do judgment and justice. And she gave the king a hundred and twenty talents of gold and spices of very great store and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. And the navy also of Hiram that brought gold from Ophir, brought in from Ophir great plenty of almond trees and precious stones. And the king made of the almond trees pillars for the house of the Lord, and for the king's house harps also and psalteries for singers. There came no such almond trees, nor was seen unto this day. And King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her, of his royal bounty. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. This very detailed account of the queen coming to King Solomon exemplifies parallels by way of application, teaches us many things about a gospel <coughs> response that people should display or enact or carry through as they hear of the fame, if you will, of Jesus Christ. First gospel lesson 
from the Queen of the South. Whereas the Queen had to come from the uttermost parts of the earth, you have the Word of God very close. The Queen of the South came from at least hundreds of miles. Some commentators place her at about a thousand miles away to come and hear the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. Solomon, as you know, had much wisdom in things natural and economic and political and wisdom wise, but she came all that way relative to his understanding, his fame concerning the name of the Lord. And to come from this great distance in those days was no small undertaking. It was a long trip. She had to have many servants accompany her. They had to bring provisions because it was not a one-day trip. They had to gear up in their mind for the trip. They had to plan for the trip and then they had to undertake it. And she was going herself. She had servants. She was a queen, super rich. She could have sent servants to double check this account that she had heard, but she went herself hundreds of miles, perhaps as many as a thousand, from the uttermost parts of the earth, riding a camel. That can't be very comfortable. But she was willing to go to any extent to seek out Solomon, to find out what is it about this, this Lord that you serve, who has blessed you, who has set you as king over his Israel. But whereas the queen had to come from the uttermost parts of the earth, this generation has the word of salvation near, accessible, <coughs> free in many venues. You need not go to the other side of the globe. The word of salvation is close. Christ can be found. The tragedy of this culture today is that people will put themselves out for many things. People will enact self-denial for many things. People will go a long way for many things, except when it comes to the things of the Lord. And yet the Lord, for all of that, is as close as the Word of God, is as close as a faithful brother or sister who will speak to you as close as prayer is. Here we call Romans 10, verse 6 and following. The righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Do not say in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, near thee, even in thy mouth, in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The tremendous truth of the gospel in several passages is distilled down to very simple truths that can be understood even by young children. And boys and girls, men and women need not think they have to climb up to heaven or go down to the uttermost parts of the, 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 the earth. The word of God, the word of righteousness is near. It's close. And if you're familiar with the scriptures, you know that this imagery is painted often. For example, call upon him while he is near. Though you cannot see into the heavenly realm, though you cannot ask him for a sign, he is near. The Queen of Sheba was commended by the Lord because she undertook this strenuous, taxing 
uh, effort to find out this wisdom that God had given Solomon. She sought it out. She worked. She labored to get it. And Jesus said she will rise in the judgment to condemn that generation of Jews who also had the word of God nigh unto them, who had it to some degree in abundance. We have it in abundance. As I mentioned, faithful brethren, faithful pastor, a church, literature, all things pointing to Jesus Christ as Savior. Even if Christ had said, to find me, you have to go to the uttermost parts of the earth, you have to do some great work, you have to labor until you feel like there's nothing left to give. Even if he had said that, it would be worth it. But it's not of works, and the word is nigh. He's pointing to this queen. She was on the uttermost parts of the earth, but she came to hear. She came to find out for herself. Second gospel lesson. The Queen of Sheba communed with Solomon of all that was in her heart. And this characterizes to some degree what coming to Christ is all about. Communing with all of your heart. As opposed to repeating a sinner's prayer that somebody else writes. As opposed to going through some ritualistic thinking or action. This queen unburdened her heart. She asked questions or riddles, as it is in the Hebrew. And you must come to Christ with an open heart. Nothing can be hidden. Nothing can be intentionally kept back. You must open up your heart with all of its vanities its miserableness, its sins, its lack of grace, its doubts, its fears. Those of you who are believers know this is how you came to Christ. Totally empty, totally transparent, with questions, but no false veneer. Nothing external in that sense. God searches the hearts. He tries the reins. He created you. He knows you better than you know yourself. In verse 2, the second half, verse B, the focus seems to be on this, this communing with Solomon. She didn't try to impress Solomon with her standing, with her stature. She doesn't give him a gift until later, after this whole interview, this whole meeting is happening. She wants to hear from him. She has questions. She has doubts. She heard a report. She wants to find out for herself. But this communing aspect seems to be a focus here in First Kings, <coughs> reminding us that true religion is a heart matter. No window dressing. No false pretenses. The Lord does not see as a man sees. Men look on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Which why is why he says, Son, give me thy heart. This is whole inward principle. And that's one thing that the scribes and the Pharisees could not get. They always looked on the external. They only perceived the outward. That was the religion they prescribed. Touch not, taste not, handle not. Wash the cup, wash the dish. You didn't wash it enough, wash it twice. And Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, he was receiving sinners, publicans, tax collectors, Gentiles. If he looked on the outward, he would dismiss everybody. If he looked on the inward, he would dismiss everybody. But he looked on the need of the heart. He looked inward. He looked past the outward. 
He said in the same chapter, if you make the tree good, the fruit will be good. But it starts at the root. It starts in the heart. And so your heart must be right in the sight of God. This is what the queen did when she came to Solomon. As I said, she did not give him a gift. She went straight to him with her heart. It appears as though she had doubts. She heard these reports and she said that there's no way it's true. She had to go herself to hear. If you don't know Christ in sincerity and truth, he bids you to come to him with your heart. With all of the troubles, with all of the sin, with all of the misgivings, with all of the stupidity, with all of who you are in Adam, he already knows who you are. He already knows the amount of scripture verses that you already maybe even have memorized. He knows the, the sermons you've heard, the teaching you've heard. He knows our sufficiency is of God alone. And so we can check all those external things, all of those works, whatever they are, at the door when we come to Christ. She communed with Him with all of her heart. She unburdened it. She told Him the dark secrets, the bad things. And she communed, she, she asked questions, she was seeking, she was knocking, she was asking, she was probing. You know, it's, it's not that she was doubting God and asking God to prove himself. More than it was, she was trying to find out the truth of the matter. She had heard some. Obviously, when she came into his presence, she started to realize, as a matter of fact, this notoriety that has gone out from him. Already, as I'm approaching him, I can see the reality of some of it. She communed with all of her heart. True religion is a matter of the heart, as at that foundation, that basis. The third gospel lesson. She says. In verse 7, I did not believe the words until I came, and mine eyes saw and beheld, and the half of it was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame which I heard. The third lesson is simply this, just as the queen did not believe until she came and saw, an unbeliever must come to him before you will believe. Now sometimes we use that phrase, coming to Christ, as a synonym for believing. I am dissecting this whole process just a little bit more. She hears, she comes, she sees, she believes. In terms of the gospel, in this, this very simplistic term, we see this order. The unbeliever hears something about Christ, something about the gospel. They come, that is, they ask questions maybe of themselves, maybe they search the scriptures, maybe they ask a believer, but they come. And then they see, that is, the perception is brought into reality, in their mind, in their heart. And then they believe. Let's consider these four steps very briefly. And I'm not trying to give you a methodology, but I'm just trying to show you how this, this transaction of grace very often occurs. The first step, she hears. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You hear something about Jesus Christ. Maybe you hear that he came into the world to save sinners. Maybe you hear that he's coming again. Maybe you hear that he is Lord of all. Maybe you hear that he's seeking sinners. You might have much head knowledge, memory verses, for example, but you hear. 
The mind assents to truth intellectually. You agree intellectually. You have some cursory knowledge because you've heard something about Christ. Second step, coming. Coming to see the truth. Communing with Him. Opening up your heart to Him. Only in coming to Him, in questioning Him, if you will, in thinking it through, in looking at these spiritual arguments, only in coming is there a chance to see the kingdom, to understand about it, for have Him to take that word and apply it to your heart, mixing it with faith. Jesus told the Pharisees on another occasion, you will not come to me that you might have eternal life. I encourage you to come to him so that you may. Matthew Henry said the only reason why sinners die in their sins is because they will not come to Christ for life and happiness. It's not because they cannot come, it's because they will not come. That's that opening of the door, trying to think his thoughts after him, examining the scriptures, taking it one more step. The third step is seeing. Do you remember blind Bartimaeus? The scriptures refer to him as an unsaved man, as blind. He could not see anything until Christ healed his blindness. If you are not saved, the Bible uses this imagery of being spiritually blind. You cannot see the spiritual world. The God of this world has blinded the minds of those which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, shine unto them. You cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot understand it. You can see the world. You can be content with the things of the world, but you cannot understand who you are and what your life is relative to how the gospel describes it apart from Christ. And this is where fallen man is kept until grace comes in. You cannot see the riches of the kingdom. You cannot see the blessedness of a relationship with Christ. This is what communist countries do. They do not allow outward press to come in. They do not let you see what, if you're living in, in some country, they don't let you see what America is like, lest you want to move to America and be an American. They're cloistered. They're kept under wraps. All of us in Adam's fallen race are this way. The queen came to Solomon to see for herself. Now in the gospel, God must give us eyes to see. Otherwise we will not see. But don't get caught between hearing, coming, and seeing. That's why all of these imperatives of the gospel ask. Seek, knock, search for me like you would search for treasure. Mine the word of God. Fourth step is believing. And this is the result of every true inquirer who hears, comes, and sees. Trusting in him. Confessing with their mouth. She said something pretty remarkable when she said, she had heard of this report and she says the half of it was not told to me. And she goes through this litany of what she saw. And whatever report she had heard, she realized it was undercutting who Solomon was. Now when she first heard it, she thought it was exaggerated. She thought it was unbelievable. Which is why she had to come for herself. And she comes for herself and she finds out no, it's just the opposite. So it is when we come into the kingdom of God. Eye has not seen, nor has ear heard, hither has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those that love him. 
When I became born again, as I'm sure your experience is as well, we had no idea of the riches of Christ. We had no idea how much God was for us. We had no idea that we could, we could pray and have an audience with the king at any time. We had no idea what was in the word of God. We had no idea what heaven would be like, and even now, our knowledge is so faint and, and obscure. Mm. We had no idea about the vanity of this life, the futility. Amen. We had no idea what was our purpose in life. As we went about trying to fill our life with this thing or that thing, attaching importance to something that is just going to pass away anyway. The half of it was not told to us as well. Fourthly and lastly, we see the king's response. And there is clearly application to the Christian. In verse 13, we see that he gave her all of her desire, whatsoever she asked. Besides that, he gave her of his royal bounty. <coughs> This monumental fact is that it illustrates perfectly the reception that sinners receive when they come to Christ. Amazing as it is, the Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things. It says there, he gave her all of her desire. The Bible says that when we become born again, we have different desires, different wants, different likes. Mm. He exchanges those carnal, fleshly desires for spiritual desires. Desires that are pointed heavenward. He gives us, this, this, the Psalms say, the desires of our heart. New desires. Spurgeon said this, Men who delight in God desire or ask for nothing except that which will please God. So it's safe to give them carte blanche because their will is subdued to God's. And so now they may have whatever they will. Materially speaking, the queen of Sheba had need of nothing. She was rich. She had gold. She had spices, precious stones. She had servants. She had lands. But the gift that Solomon gave her, the gift that Christ gives an unbeliever who comes to him by faith, excels any human possession no matter what it is. He gave a gift commensurate with his stature as a king along with his kingdom. True riches, wealth of grace, this is what God's children hunger and th thirst for. And the scripture spells out many blessings that the child of God comes into unawares Receiving, as we walk through this pilgrimage, on the right hand and the left hand, spiritual treasures every day. I've quoted this, this song before, but it, it speaks volumes. Great is thy faithfulness. I think this was a Fanny Crosby hymn, I'm not sure, but listen to the words as they try to echo what they have received in Christ. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, blessings all mine with 10,000 besides. That last phrase, with 10,000 besides, that's no exaggeration. He gave her all of her desire, what she asked for. Application to, to prayer, 
Again, God changes our hearts, our desires, and what we ask him for. This is the confidence that we now have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. And it goes on to say that if that was not enough, he gave to her out of his royal bounty, a royal bounty. This is what Christ gives. This is the inheritance of the believer that he gives to his own out of his royal bounty, not the least of which his presence himself. Much like the prodigal son who came, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. This is the reception a person has when they come to Christ. He gives up his best. He knows your need. He sees the overarching long view. He gives in the immediate term fellowship with him, more love to him. The eyes of your understanding open so you can understand his will for your life. But more than that, when he gives you that new heart, your heart becomes wedded to him. And he promises that where he is, there you will be also one day. Well, those are the four lessons from, gospel lessons from this account that I wanted to share with you. It's a remarkable thing that our Lord says. This non-Jew, this woman living at the ends of the earth, she'll rise up in the midst of that religious generation and condemn them because they did not believe. They were hard-hearted. Trying to catch Christ at every word, at every good deed that he did, trying to catch him. If you don't know Christ in sincerity and in truth, if you have never come to him, this is a tremendous pattern of what it means to come to him. To come to him with your heart. To come to him with, with simple faith, if I could put it that way. Mm -hmm. To search his word out. Mm -hmm. To ask someone who you know is a believer to see if these things are really true. To try to understand what is grace all about. Yes, he must give you eyes to see and ears to hear. But what if the queen had stayed over in the uttermost parts of the earth? and never exercised any part of herself to think, to wonder, to see if it's true. This account is in the scripture for a reason. I think sometimes people that, that walk or in, in reformed circles are sometimes caught between hearing and seeing, or hearing and coming, or hearing and believing, because they, they are waiting for God to do something. And God has already done absolutely everything that needs to be done. We talk about the finished work of Christ. We talk about the completeness of grace. We talk about the efficacy of the gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, our Father, that your gospel is so complete and rich and full, and yet when it's distilled down, there is that, that element of simplicity that we all need. We thank you for Christ who, in such of a magnificent, magnificent way, reminds us of, of his ability to save, of what true religion is all about. 
We thank you for his finished work that makes a salvation even possible. We ask our Father that you would seal these words to our mind and to our heart. In Jesus' name, amen.